Geek Therapy Radio. Welcome to Geek Therapy Radio. You've got your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. Welcome in my radio audience and, of course, the podcast audience. You can find the Geek Therapy Radio podcast in most of your favorite, oops, most of your favorite podcast players. Of course, we prefer the iHeartRadio app here at iHeartMedia, but if you got Pocket Casts, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, whatever your podcast app is, Go ahead and give a search for Geek Therapy Radio Podcast. Just type in Geek Therapy Radio Podcast. Look for the red, white, and black color scheme, and that's me. So I got an email earlier today. I have a ton of international listeners to the podcast. Matter of fact, I got a separate email, not the one I just mentioned, separate email telling me how good my podcast does. I believe it's in Sweden says, hey, your podcast ranks like top 100 of all geek podcasts in Sweden. Uh, Sweden's not a huge country, but still I am honored that I am one of the top technology and geek podcasts in, what's the population of Sweden? Five million, something like that. So I'm, I'm honored. But yeah, I've got international listeners all over the place. Israel, uh, Japan, Australia, lots in Holland, Netherlands. Lots in uh, Argentina and in South America and, of course, all across the United States. But the actual email I was mentioning is it was a listener somewhere from Europe saying that he likes to drive his Tesla around. I won't name him because he doesn't probably want me naming him on the radio uh, without getting clearance first. But he listens on TuneIn and Spotify. But Geek Therapy Radio is not on TuneIn or Spotify, at least not as of yet. I will let you know. I will I will work on getting it on TuneIn and Spotify. That's been on the back of my mind for a few years now, for a few years now, is getting it on TuneIn and Spotify. Those are very, very popular audio apps, audio applications. Lots of people listen to, to, to podcasts through those platforms. So I'm going to work hard on trying to get Geek Therapy Radio on TuneIn and Spotify. No promises, but I will work on it. All right, so, oh, one quick more, another quick plug, which I'll plug, you know, towards the end of all these segments also, geektherapyradio.com. I wanted to mention real quick about geektherapyradio.com. When I say the first thing you see on there is a contact form, so you can let me know your geek thing or ask me any sort of questions or comments, like about the podcast, for instance, like I just went over, that does not sign you up for any sort of mailing list or email letter or anything like that. It's literally just... A text to me, basically. You, I don't send you a bunch of spam. You aren't automatically subscribed to any anything at all. It's just a way to, to reach out to me. Just think of it like a text message or just a normal email. So geektherapyradio.com is where you can do that. All right. If you've been catching up with me, if you if you are caught up with me through the podcast, you know that the last podcast I went over the fact that for the first time in my life, I bought a brand new Mac, particularly the 13-inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Apple Silicon processor in it. And I have been putting it through its paces for the past couple days. I've run into a hiccup here or there, but mind-bogglingly, not many. In the previous podcast, I mentioned how perfectly Pro Tools runs under Rosetta 2 emulation and how perfect Reaper runs both as a a native M1 beta and through Rosetta 2 x86 emulation. Matter of fact, what you're listening to right now again is me recording my voice directly into the MacBook Pro itself, the built-in quote-unquote studio-grade microphone built into the MacBook Pro itself. I'm doing that again, so if you're listening to the radio broadcast, I'm not using any sort of external microphone. I'm not using a broadcast microphone. The main speaker for the MacBook Pro is literally underneath the left speaker grill. So I'm about four or five inches away from that doing the radio show just like this. It's an awesome built-in microphone. But I've been putting the the MacBook Pro through its paces. It wasn't cheap. It's going to be my daily workhorse. I want to get it up to speed. I want to integrate it into my daily workflow. And I have not come across many problems at all, if at all. I've been running through uh, emul- like video game emulators. I mentioned in the last podcast I wasn't able to figure out how to get PPSSPP working. That's a uh, PlayStation Portable PSP emulator. 
an update for that is I have gotten it working. It's a program called Open Emu, which is kind of like RetroArch, uh, but not. You have a bunch of, uh, what do you call them? Cores. So you have like a Game Boy Core, a Game Boy Color Core, Game Boy Advance Core, all the Atari cores, Dreamcast cores, PSP core, PlayStation 1 core. And the only hang up I've come across on there is that it reminded me that there's no, there's really not a good PS2 emulator for Mac. On the PC side of things, you have PCSX2, I think that's the PlayStation 2 emulator, and it runs amazingly. I love playing Gran Turismo 4 on the PS2 emulator on the Windows side of things, but there's no such decent, stable emulator on the Mac side of things, probably because there wasn't a whole ton of you know, demand to port PlayStation 2 emulator for Mac. There, I think there's an emulator called Play, exclamation point. I think that's what it's called. But it's buggy. It doesn't really work very well. And by all accounts, you know, the advice is don't really mess with it. But I do have my emulators running flawlessly. So Super Nintendo, uh, NES, Atari, like I mentioned, all the Game Boy stuff, Game Boy Advance, all of that, and, and Nintendo DS, all of that is running perfectly on the M1-powered MacBook Pro. And it's kind of the inception of emulation. It's it's Open Emu, which is an x86 program being emulated through Rosetta 2 to run video game emulation. There's so many layers of emulation. And why that's important and why that's so mind-boggling is it's all flawless. Even with the performance hit that emulation takes, multiple levels of emulation takes, it still runs everything flawlessly. I'm playing uh, Go, um, God of War for PSP, Ghost of Sparta and Chains of Olympus. Perfect frame rates, perfect, no bo bogging down, throwing all sorts of shaders on there, looks amazing. You can make it look like it's running on a VHS tape, <laughs> which is so, so freaking cool, and it just knocks it all out of the park. I'm going to continue this discussion on the M1 because I've discovered some more things. I'm going to let you kind of know more about what, how I've integrated it into my, my, my daily work schedule here at Geek Therapy Radio, but I want to remind you one more time on the way out. In case you change channels during the commercials, geektherapyradio.com. Also, you can go to your favorite podcast app and try to see if Geek Therapy Radio is in there. It will be in most, but just type in Geek Therapy Radio podcast. Look for the red, white, and black color scheme, and that's me. You are listening to Geek Therapy Radio on KPRC 950 right now. I am your mental curator reminding you that we are all geeks about something. So let's keep geeking out about the Apple MacBook Pro M1 after the break. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. You've got your mental curator, Johnny Hemberger, here. Once again, reminding you to check out geektherapyradio.com. There's lots of cool stuff there. There's ways to, ways to support the show there as well. But the very first thing you see is the contact form. And like I mentioned earlier, it doesn't put you on any sort of emailing list. It's just literally a way to send me an email. So check out geektherapyradio.com for all of that and for more information about, about my show. So... To bring us up to speed here, if you're just joining Geek Therapy Radio, I just got a 13-inch MacBook Pro powered by the M1 Apple Silicon Processor, and I am recording the entire radio show into the built-in microphone built into the laptop. For those who want to know, it's underneath the left speaker grill. That's where the, the microphone is. Apple says it's a quote-unquote studio-grade microphone, and I think it does sound really good. I think it holds its own against... Reasonably priced, I would say, cheap USB condenser microphones. So cheap USB large diaphragm, or even small diaphragm condenser microphones. It it sounds like a hundred dollar USB mic. I don't know how else to put that, and that doesn't mean it's not a bad thing. I have USB microphones that cost less than a hundred dollars that I have traveled the world with and recorded this show with. The Samson Meteorite, for one. Or, sorry, the Samson Meteor, I believe, for one, uh, sounds amazing. It's under $100. The Samson Go mic also sounds incredible. I think it's $50 or $60. So the built-in microphone to the MacBook Pro sounds amazing. If you're listening to the AM radio, would you have any idea that I'm not using a $5,000 signal chain 
microphone broadcasting setup. Normally what I use to record these shows is a, is a Electro Voice RE27. It's an industry standard microphone. Everybody you listen to on the radio is using that microphone or a Shure SM7B. It, expensive microphones, expensive signal chains. But on AM radio especially, are you going to be able to tell? If I didn't tell you that I was using a built-in laptop microphone, you wouldn't believe it. And even if you're listening to the podcast, it should sound it should sound very high quality. And that's one reason why I went with the MacBook Pro as opposed to the Air. The Air has a good built-in microphone. The MacBook Pro takes the same microphone from the the uh, old 16-inch MacBook Pro that introduced the quote unquote. I always got to say quote unquote studio grade microphone array. It's been added to the 13 inch MacBook Pro here, and that's what I'm using to record this uh, radio show into. A DAW, a DAW called Reaper, a digital audio workstation called Reaper. Usually I prefer Cakewalk. I also like Pro Tools, but I'm using Reaper here because Reaper works across Mac, Windows, and Raspberry Pi. Pro Tools works across Mac and Windows, of course. My favorite DAW, Cakewalk Sonar, is only Windows. But on that note, that leads me perfectly into some of the discoveries and tinkerings I've been doing with getting Windows applications to run on the 13-inch M1 MacBook Pro. Because remember, Boot Camp is no longer available on MacBooks, any MacBook running the M1. At least Boot Camp is not available for now until Microsoft possibly codes a version of Windows 10 to run natively on the Apple M1 ARM processor, which would be amazing because there'd be a few lines of code away from running on any ARM processor. Windows 10 running flawlessly on a Raspberry Pi without all sorts of hacking and, and, and tinkery. There are versions you can technically run Windows on a Raspberry Pi. It's not the most intuitive process in the world. There are setbacks. There are caveats. There are glitches. You can kind of do it. But if Microsoft themselves recompiles and codes Windows to run natively on ARM, not through any sort of emulation as they kind of do now with the Samsung Galaxy Book S, but run natively on an ARM processor, That'd be amazing. But there are Windows applications that I wanted to test out on the MacBook Pro. And without Boot Camp, how do you do that? There is a company called, I want to say, is it Code Weavers? Let me Google this right now. I think it is Code Weavers. But let me double check. Code, yeah, Code Weavers. And they make a program, sorry, they make a program called Crossover, which basically relies on an underlying process, an underlying emulator, if you will. I know it's kind of a bad word when you talk about this program. Wine. So Crossover run, utilizes an emulator called Wine to let you run Windows applications inside of Mac operating systems, in this case, Big Sur. But there's another level of complexity here because we are running on an ARM processor, not x86. It's the Apple M1 processor. So I've been doing all sorts of tinkering to see what I could get working on the uh, on the Apple M1 processor through crossover and one of the first things i did was installed steam the windows version of steam through crossover now you may be wondering Johnny, you can get Steam for Mac OS, and I've seen videos on YouTube where they even install Steam on Mac OS, on the M1 MacBook Pro running under Rosetta 2. That's great, but I have been trying for the past two days to download the Mac version of Steam, which it downloads just fine. But the installation process, it installs, and then you go, the issue I'm running into is I open Steam. Maybe one of you listening can help me with this. Open Steam, it says, this program can't work. You should throw it in the trash can. It, or the, the, the file is corrupt or, or something like that. I'm like, why? I watch YouTube videos, and I see people installing Steam all the time. Maybe what I suspect is those videos are from a few days ago, and I think Steam has altered the code so that it's not compatible with the M1 processor for now until Steam can ish, can can uh, you know iron out the bugs and make it run natively on M1. So I would be surprised if it takes Steam more than a month to do that. Honestly, if we don't have Steam running, you know, perfectly on the Apple M1 MacBook Pro before Christmas, I'd be surprised. So the only re way I can run Steam right now is to install it through crossover and the process was relatively painless 
there's kind of like a resolution. Steam doesn't look as crisp, like the text and everything doesn't look as crisp. The scaling doesn't look as crisp running Steam through crossover, but it does work. In the very first program that I tested running Steam through crossover was Rocket League. Rocket League by far is the game I play the most on Steam outside of Microsoft Flight Simulator, which Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 just I doubt it will ever come to Mac, which is a crying shame. It's a Microsoft software, so it kind of makes sense that it wouldn't, even though you'd say, well, Microsoft makes Microsoft Office and, Win- and uh, Word and Excel and all that stuff runs on Mac. Yeah, well, gaming is, a, is another thing. I doubt we're ever going to get Flight Simulator running natively on the Apple M1. I think, hopefully, I read a comment somewhere on one of these reviews of, of Steam gaming on the Apple M1 back when you could just, you know, a few days ago when you could just apparently get Steam to work natively on the M1 processor, or at least through Rosetta. One of the comments was, can someone please test out Steam Link on the Apple M1? MacBook Pro and MacBook Air and Mac Mini? Well, Unfortunately, Steam Link is not available on the MacBook Pro M1 Air or the Mac Mini. It just it doesn't work. Steam Link is an iOS application, and as of right now, it does not work on uh, the M1. It says you need to either have an iPad, an iPhone, or Apple TV to get Steam Link to work. But I do, again, think that's going to change once Steam gets on the ball with recoding Steam to run on the Apple uh, M1 processor, I think Steam Link is right behind that. And the reason why that's important is that means that technically then I could theoretically play Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 on my M1 powered MacBook Pro through Steam Link over the internet. So I'd have my big beefy workstation Ryzen 9 uh, CPU computer running at home in Missouri City, then I could be at work Uh, here in the Galleria and use Steam Link to link to my home gaming PC and run Microsoft Flight Simulator or or show Microsoft Flight Simulator on the screen of the MacBook Pro and it'd be able to do it that way remotely. But Rocket League, running through crossover on Steam, Steam crossover Rocket League, it works, it's glitchy, and there is no controller support as of now. So... It's kind of a dud. It's kind of one of the glitches with the M1 right now, but all of that will be sorted. Mark my words. And that's what's fun about having the Apple M1 right now is all of that stuff is going to get sorted out. Let's keep talking about the M1. I don't know for how long. Coming back into the next uh, next segment, you are listening to Geek Therapy Radio. Go to geektherapyradio.com for more information. Download and subscribe to the Geek Therapy Radio podcast in your favorite podcast app. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. You've got your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. Go check out geektherapyradio.com to contact me directly and get more information and find out how to support the show. Maybe you're a local business owner and you want to get uh, some awareness for your for your business. Maybe you own a, a hobby shop or an electronics store or whatever you got. Any, I'm trying to work up a base of local Houston iconic small businesses to have in my repertoire of advertisers here in Geek Therapy Radio. I think it's very important to support local business. Speaking of that, we'll get back to the MacBook uh, Pro M1 in a in a moment here. I visit this is kind of pro bono, but this is free. I visited Third Planet uh, comic what is it comic is sci-fi Superstore. I'm sorry, I butchered it. Everyone knows where Third Planet is. It's that blue building on Highway 59. You've seen it. It says Third Planet, big blue building. I went in there the other day and I picked up a book of Street Fighter art, you know, Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter 3, Street Fighter 4, all that, uh, an art uh, book. It basically, it's, oh man, this thing weighs like five pounds. It's a coffee table book and it's awesome. It's a local business, been here over 40 years, and I highly suggest you stop in. I, I, I made a post about it on Instagram or, or Twitter or both saying that you don't just stop in a third planet without actually getting something. It's a freaking dreamscape in there. Another business I want to make a shout out to, and again, nobody's paying me for this. I hope nobody calls me. My bosses don't call me saying you shouldn't be giving shout outs for businesses that aren't paying you. 
now more than ever, I think it's I think we owe it to ourselves and owe it to our community to help promote small businesses. I'm not making the entire show about promoting, promoting local businesses, but I think it's important right now to do so, especially with the holidays coming up and it's, we're during the pandemic and 2020 sucks and a lot of them are closing their doors. We need to support each other. So there's a few Houston businesses I would like to support right now. Cactus Music. Don't forget about Cactus Music. Don't forget about Rockin' Robin. I've been going to Rockin' Robin since I was a little boy with my dad. Rockin' Robin is that music store that Steve Ray Vaughan on the side of it. It is a Houston icon. What's another one? EPO, Electronic Parts Outlet, is another Disneyland for hobbyists and for geeks. EPO. Uh, and there's probably, I mean, I, there's definitely so many more local Houston in- institutions that I can name here. But those are the, some of them off the top of my head that I want to remind you to go to go visit. So Third Planet Sci-Fi Superstore, Rock and Robin, Cactus Music, and Electronic Parts Outlet (EPO). Those are all local businesses. You should be shopping there over the holidays. Help them out. It's more important now more than ever. I also want to plug real quick, and I promise we'll get back to the M1. My brother's coffee house. They ship coffee. So no matter where you are in the world, if you want to support my brother's coffee house, it's really good. It's called George Provisions or George Coffee. I'll link it in the podcast description. Let me get this right. Yeah, George Coffee and Provisions. It's georgecoffeeandprovisions.com. G-O-R-G-E. That's how you spell George. George Coffee and Provisions. Dot com. They make great gifts. I They send me bags every once in a while. It's really good coffee, and it's my brother and sister-in-law and his family's coffee shop. They just, they, they got a food truck, not a food truck, it's like a food trailer where they can make coffee and bagels and donuts and provide small pastries and stuff like that along with the coffee and French presses and espressos and everything. They can go around mobily around their community there in uh, Coppell up north of Dallas. But GeorgeCoffeeAndProvisions.com is where you can go to visit them. And I'll put links, again, in the in the podcast description to all these places that I mentioned. If there are links, if they do have websites, I will put them in there. Okay. Support local small business. Let's talk about the Apple M1. But right before we, I got back from the break, I noticed something interesting. There's a couple... I'm looking at it right now. It's... It has to do with charging and the charging adapters that you can <clears throat> and can't use and the charging characteristics of the MacBook Pro. It's really weird. So, for one thing, I have tested a couple different chargers. You know that MacBooks in particular are, are, very, are very particular about what chargers they will use to charge their products. They'll, they'll, they'll do an electronic handshake, and you can't just use any sort of USB Type-C charger with the MacBook Pro or the MacBook Air. If it doesn't like it, it won't let you charge. But I've been trying on a couple bricks, so obviously the one that came supplied works just fine. And then I have a smaller one that came with my... Uh, uh, why am I blanking out on the name? It's a very small laptop. It charges over USB-C. And the MacBook Pro work with that too. It took a few, like a couple minutes to do the handshake. It said, you know, plugged in but not charging. And then I, I checked it again, and there's a little lightning bolt plugged in charging. It just charges a little slower than the big wall wart that came with the MacBook Pro. So something funny that I noticed is that when I unplugged it from the big wall wart, it said 95% battery. That's when I unplugged it. When I took it over here to the other desk, the other side of the desk to record the radio show this week, I noticed that it was still unplugged, obviously, and the battery said 100%. How did, what? How did you go up 5% while you're unplugged? I, I, I don't, I can't figure that out. Is that some sort of glitch? I don't know. So I plugged it back into, it's, it's charging right now, I plugged it back into the small wall wart, and when I plugged it into the small wall wart, it said 95%. Like, wait a second. It went back down, like, five, lost 5%. I unplugged it at 95%, said 100%. I plugged it in with 100%, now it says 95%, and then, you know, a few minutes to fully charged. There's some weirdness going on with the charging there. There is battery optimization going on. Like, it won't charge. It'll learn your habits of charging. It'll try to learn your habits of charging and not charge to 100% until it knows you're going to start using the laptop again. Lithium lithium polymer, lithium iron batteries don't really like to stay at 
peak charred is not great for the overall longevity really kind of the butter zone for lithium based batteries is to charge them to about you know 90 95 percent discharge them down to 10 percent or so 20 percent then but keep it between like 15 percent and 95 percent that's kind of the butter zone uh, of lithium uh, lithium ion lithium polymer batteries. That's not gospel truth that it varies between battery chemistries and battery manufacturers, but in general, you don't want to overcharge and you don't want to overly discharge deep cycle batteries, whether or not they're lithium or ion or not. You just, you don't want to keep them too charged because they bubble lead acid batteries, lead acid deep cycle batteries bubble. And then I don't know what lithium polymer does. It can, it can, they can get gassy. Lithium based batteries can get gassy and poochy. I know because my DJI Mavic Pro drone has uh, obviously a lithium-based battery pack, and it bulges. It it's kind of concerning. It bulges so much that it pushes against it pushes against the latch, the two latches, the clips keeping the the battery in place, the battery in the drone. So it's kind of it's it's kind of concerning. And what I did, and I shouldn't have done this, and I, I don't know why I'm confessing it right here on Geek Therapy Radio, but we're all you know. When we tinker with things and we we are hobbyists about things, we make mistakes. I took a I took a small pin. It's going to sound insane when I tell you this over the air, and, and I might get email about how stupid I am. I took a tiny little pin and I barely poked the tiniest little hole in the outer casing, like f- I don't know, fabric material, plastic of the lithium battery. I did not punch it in like an inch. I didn't punch it in even a millimeter. I just made kind of like, I, I touched that outer shell of the lithium battery with the pin to, to relieve some of the pressure. And it did, and it runs just fine. I, I didn't experience, it, there was no runaway thermal reaction. It didn't burst into flames or anything like that. I just kind of relieved the pressure, the gas that had built up inside this battery pack. The way I saw it is like, okay, well, either... Either this thing pops itself out of its connector mid-flight when it's 400 feet in the air and kills somebody, or I can take the battery out and go into the middle of the driveway on the concrete and put a little tiny microscopic pinhole in it to relieve the pressure. Worst case scenario, the battery bursts into flames right there in the middle of the driveway and I can't do anything about it. Uh, Best case scenario, it alleviates the problem and it latches perfectly back into the DJI Mavic and there's no longer the risk of it busting out of its latches mid-flight. So I poked the hole in the battery and everything's been fine. That was months and months and months ago and it's been perfectly fine. So the M1, that's one thing I noticed was that charging, that little charging anomaly. We're running out of time here in this segment. I will say that also through crossover, running Steam through crossover, I was able to get Cakewalk uh, Touch. What is it? Cakewalk. And it's not Sonar. I wasn't able to get Sonar working, my favorite digital audio workstation. I wasn't able to get that working. But I got the kind of stripped down touch version of it working. It was low and laggy and jaggy, but it worked just fine. And that's all That's all to say that these anomalies will get worked out. That Cakewalk software has no business running on a Mac. It was never designed to run on a Mac. And the fact that I got it running, it, period, was, it was mind-boggling. I want to talk about DaVinci Resolve, at least to start the final segment. So you're listening to Geek Therapy Radio. Go to geektherapyradio.com for more information. Let's keep talking about the MacBook, at least for a little bit, going into the final segment. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. You've got your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. If you're just joining me, one more reminder. I'm recording this entire radio show into the built-in microphone of my 13-inch MacBook Pro, my new 2020 M1-powered MacBook Pro. The speaker, the the microphone that is underneath the left speaker grill. Apple says this is a quote unquote studio quality microphone, and I think it's about on par with a hundred dollar USB condenser microphone. But you be the judge. It's kind of hard to tell on AM radio. But if I hadn't told you, 
that I was using a built-in laptop microphone. Would you believe me? It, I, it's perfectly serviceable for AM radio, and if you listen to the podcast, I think you'd think that for a built-in laptop microphone especially, it sounds pretty darn good. So for the majority of this radio show, I've been talking about my experience with the new uh, 2020 MacBook Pro 13 inch with the M1 Apple Silicon processor. This is my first Mac that I've ever bought brand new. I have tinkered with Macs throughout my life. I went to sound school and any recording studio you go into, it's going to be a Mac. So I was learning audio on like a Mac G3 or Mac G4, maybe it was a G5, I forget. We've got a few Macs and iMacs and stuff around the radio station that I I rarely have to go in and interact with. And the last Mac that I owned for myself was like a 2005 or 2006 iMac with a 32-bit Core 2 Duo. That's the last Mac that I owned, and I bought that thing in like 2012. It was already old by the time I bought it. I just wanted to get that old Mac to stay familiar with with Mac OS. So this MacBook Pro 13-inch, M1 powered MacBook Pro 13-inch, is the first Mac that I've ever bought brand new. I have never spent this much money on a computer outright before. This computer is going to be my daily driver, and I have been putting it through its paces. I just spent this last radio show and the podcast before talking about all the paces that I've been putting it through. And that requires going from Windows to Mac. I, I should reiterate right here. I have not joined like the Mac cult, and I'm doing my air quotes that you can't see. It's, it has nothing to do with joining a Mac cult. I am not turning my back on Windows. I'm not turning my back on x86 processors. Not at all. It's impossible to do so even if I wanted to. There's still so much that I have to do using Windows. There's so much software that I use running that I have to use on Windows. I use Windows every day for work. My main work PC is Windows. I just built a Ryzen 9 12 core 24 thread workstation gaming PC that's x86 and runs da -da -da -da, Windows 10. So I'm not going anywhere from Windows. I just wanted to get on the ground floor of this ARM processor Mac M1 revolution because as I mentioned in previous podcast, I think it's going to send waves throughout the industry. Mark my words, within the next few years, you're gonna see Windows-based devices based on ARM processing. And while people are coding, third-party developers and software developers are coding for the Mac M1 ARM processor, that means it's relatively a few lines of codes away from running on the Snapdragon processor in our Android phones, or the Exynos processor in Android phones. And perhaps even more excitingly, the ARM processors in our Raspberry Pi single board computers. It's a revolutionary time to, to be a computer computer geek and I have been on the fence for years about when I would jump in and buy a Mac and I am glad I waited. It was a it was a very conscious investment, very conscious decision to buy a MacBook Pro right now when I did. And I know people say, "Well, you shouldn't get the first generation of anything." I agree. Most part, I agree. I know that next year or in the next few months and six months or whatever it is, Apple's going to announce the M1X processor or whatever or the M2 processor or the M3. It's only going to get better from here. But here's the thing. It is already – it's staggering what they have done with this first generation of, M, of uh, M1 processor of Apple Silicon. If it only gets better from here, that's awesome. But I tend to keep my computers for years. The next time I would consider a new Mac, it's probably going to be at minimum. I mean, minimum, if I am just baller status, three years before I would probably consider getting another Mac, if that. It's probably going to be like five years. And honestly... I don't see myself getting a whole bunch of Mac devices to to fully, you know, dive into that ecosystem. My smartphone is still a Samsung. It's an Android. I don't have an iPhone. I, the last iPhone I had was an iPhone 4S. I think in the interim, when one of my Androids broke, I actually got pushed into a pool with my Galaxy Note 3 in my pocket. I used uh, my wife's old iPhone SE for a little while. So my phone is Android. Samsung Galaxy Note 9. I've got no intentions to upgrade my phone. I've got no intentions to get any more computers right now. I do have an iPad, except that I gave that iPad to my wife so that I can get a Galaxy Tab S6. 
an Android tablet. So it's like I'm all over the place. I'm a hodgepodge of of technology and, and, and ecosystem use, users. I use Android and I use Mac and I use Windows. But I kind of have to, you know? I, I run a geek radio show that expressly admits that we're all geeks about something, which means that I kind of have to keep my pulse on a whole lot of stuff. And I can't sit here and talk about Macs without being fully enveloped and, and familiar with the Mac ecosystem. So using a MacBook Pro as my daily driver, I have no choice but to get immersed in the ecosystem. One, this is really what I want to talk about this segment. One of the aspects or one of the kind of considerations in doing that and going to Mac OS for my daily driver laptop, at least, is that I can't use some programs that I was used to using, specifically my video editing program. If you subscribe to Geek Therapy Radio on YouTube, hey, what an awesome plug. Geek Therapy Radio on YouTube, all those videos I edit, I edit with Sony Vegas, I think it's 14 or 15. That's the video editor that I'm very that I'm most familiar with. I'm not a professional video editor, but I am absolutely I know my way around Sony Vegas. You cannot use Sony Vegas on Mac OS. You can't. I've tried. I tried through crossover, through Dreamweavers or Codeweavers crossover to get any version of Sony Vegas working on in Mac OS, in Big Sur, on the M1, and it's impossible. Well, not impossible. Nothing's impossible when it comes to programming and such, but I couldn't get it working, which means that if I'm going to use this Mac as a daily driver, I have to learn a different video editor. That means I have to learn Final Cut or Adobe Premiere or what I'm probably going to wind up using because it's free, at least you know, it's mostly for you can you can spend money on a license, but it's DaVinci Resolve, Black Magic DaVinci Resolve. I've been using it for a couple days, trying to familiar, familiarize myself with it. I can tell I need so much more education on DaVinci Resolve. It is supremely intimidating. Vegas is more like for those OGs out there who remember Acid Music. It's all like kind of clip based and it's very approachable. It's almost like the garage band of video editing. Now, I would say that Sony Vegas, it's not quite garage band. It's it's kind of like that, but it's like the Logic Pro. Garage band is like a stripped down version of Logic Pro that's more advanced. That's kind of what Vegas was. It's kind of what Vegas was kind of like Logic Pro, but presented like a garage band. I'm being very confusing. Black Magic DaVinci Resolve is supremely intimidating, but I've got no choice. If I'm going to use this laptop for my video editing needs, for most of my video editing needs, I have to learn it. It's that or Adobe Premiere or Final Cut. Final Cut costs two hundred or two or three hundred dollars. It costs a few hundred dollars. Same thing with Adobe. It's like subscription based. With Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve, I already have it. I already downloaded it, and it's running awesome under Rosetta 2. It's not even native yet. I can tell that it's amazing, that it's an amazing piece of software, but I'm going to have to just deep dive into the tutorials on, on how to use the thing. It is so intimidating. That's going to wrap it up for this show. You've been listening to Geek Therapy Radio. I'll remind you, the most important thing you can take away from this is that you are worthy of love. You are worthy of giving love. You are worthy of receiving love. And you are worthy of your own self-respect. Please know that you are loved because you are loved even if you don't believe it you can also like follow and subscribe to geek therapy radio on facebook instagram twitter and youtube look for the red white and black color scheme that's geek therapy radio thank you so much for listening if you're a small business owner and you'd like to consider sponsoring geek therapy radio just drop me a line geektherapyradio.com or email geektherapy at iheartmedia.com